Our scripture today is from Matthew, from chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Here we go with uh, the story about Jesus' older cousin, John. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Just listen. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, sorry, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then all the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region around the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the granary. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Jesus came, the world had been waiting a long time for Messiah. Messiah means God's anointed one, the one that God would send, anointed by God, to bring salvation. While sometimes the hope might have felt very present, and I know you can think of a time when hope felt very present, other times it felt like the waiting was very long. But as our Advent theme says, God could not wait. And I love that short film about how God could not wait for emperors or kings to get their act together. God could not wait for the princes and the puppet kings to figure out how to make peace. God couldn't wait. So God came to us in person, Emmanuel. As the film says, God in flesh and bone. A gift from heaven, a baby in a manger, a boy of Galilee who grew up a carpenter, who at his late 20s, maybe you're somewhere around your late 20s, early 30s, he developed his sense of call from God as God's son to go and share the gospel with everyone. And so God couldn't wait as people and families, maybe you're in a family that struggles for peace. I noticed when the peace candle was first lit for the first few minutes as a new candle, it It was, did you notice how it was flickering, flickering, flickering? Peace is flickering in our families. Like, is it going to be peace? Is it not going to be peace? And certainly in the world, in our politics, in everything we read about, peace seems to be flickering. Is there going to be peace? But God couldn't wait. And Jesus is the answer to our desire for peace. So God prepared the world in a variety of ways, um, walking with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, bringing people out of slavery in the Exodus, being with people, calling them back, calling them back. But God also prepared a man named John, which I'll call Jesus' more wild and unconventional cousin. Don't you think Jesus was a good boy? Do you think Jesus would have put on a camel's robe, gone out in the wilderness and eaten locusts dipped in honey? He probably did what Mary and Joseph said, which was to be a conventional person. 
But his unconventional cousin, John, went out and prepared himself and prepared us. So here's what's been bothering me the whole week. What really bothers me every year whenever this comes up. And that is why did the message have to be repent? Raise your hand if you like that word. Okay, just for the film, uh, for the video, I'll just say no one's raising your hand. And the people that are rubbing their nose are trying not to get their hand too high. It's like, I'm not, I'm not raising my hand. I don't like repent. It's a lot of consonants. When something has a lot of consonants, I'm, I don't know, it sounds harsh. And I've searched the Gospels up and down, though, and repent seems to be a big word. It was the first message Jesus preached. Repent, the kingdom of God is coming near. And I wish it hadn't been repent because I don't like the word. Why couldn't Jesus coming mean I just have a slightly improved version of myself? Just slightly improved. Like if I were a home, things would be just kind of cleaned up. They'd be shoved in the closet. People coming over, they don't need to see them. I'd wrap up my Amazon boxes in pretty paper the, under the tree. It would look really good. Or if I was a legislature, by the way, I don't usually preach political sermons, and I'm not about to now, but if I were a legislature and I heard the good news, maybe I could end the year by just passing some laws with some nice names, like there will here forth be National Heart Awareness Month. School Bus Safety Week. Everyone can agree on that. That would be getting something done, right? I wish it wasn't repentance because I've never seen someone walking around in public with one of those signs that says repent at the top that looked like someone I want to emulate. Let's just put it that way. I don't want to be mean. But I wish it hadn't been repent. Even though I grew up Lutheran, where we put the baptismal font when you first come in. And I've been Presbyterian a long time and we confess every week because we believe we keep messing up. I don't like thinking about sin. I don't like feeling ashamed. I don't like feeling frustrated for doing the same things over and over like Paul used to complain about. I don't like hurting people. I don't like disappointing people. So I wish it wasn't repentance that we are asked to do to get ready for Jesus to come. So I think we could maybe blame it on his upbringing, John the Baptist, that is. He was born to a kind old priest. His mother was named Elizabeth. They were both too old to have children. God prepared John by giving him traditional, faithful parents, but God also gave John a fierce independent streak. So, you know, the really good preachers are the ones that make you uncomfortable, the ones that tell you something you don't want to hear, and that's what he did. No clutter in his closet. He would never shove anything in the closet. He was who he was. John said, get ready. The kingdom of heaven is near. Make the path clear. The Lord is on his way. Repent. So yes, it does help that in the Bible in the original Greek, as Sean pointed out to me a couple of years ago, the word is metanoia. Yep. And it means change your heart. It doesn't really mean be ashamed, feel bad. It means change your heart and change your life. It means change your perspective. So you look at things in a new way. And when God prepares us with John's message, it's not about making things slightly better, shoving stuff in the closet. It's not about all the decorations. It's not about our perfect dinner that we had. It's not about those crazy relatives not acting up that come to Christmas. It's not about holding worship services with no mistakes, that's for sure. John says to get ready for Christmas, to get ready for Christ, whenever you're getting ready for Christ to come, is to get a new perspective, get a new attitude, let God change your heart and change your life, to be as honest as you can possibly be with God. Doesn't that sound fun? To be as honest as you can possibly be. 
John's word through John says in this time of year, between now the 17 days and eight hours until that candle's lit, be as honest with God as you possibly can. Take some time by yourself. Don't ask your spouse <laughs> to tell you what it is. Take your time by yourself. Talk to God as honest as you possibly can. What is not okay in my life right now? What is not really going well? What is not pleasing you? Because when that last candle's lit, wherever you are, whatever church you're in or wherever you are, I want to be clear of that. I want you to be working on that so that I can really feel, really understand, really receive Christ on Christmas. So, the religious leaders, you notice how when they come out to get baptized, maybe to hear John, he doesn't believe that they're really sincere. And so he calls them a brood of vipers, like poisonous snakes. He says, huh, Jesus will know who's the wheat and who's the chef. And over and over in the Gospel of Luke, when I say be as honest with God as you possibly can, there are specifics. It's not sin in general, it's specific sins. It's specific things to repent about. Like, for example, over in the Gospel of Luke, the crowd asked John the Baptist for specifics. And John said this, Whoever has two coats, share them with someone who doesn't have one. And whoever has food, the same thing. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. They said, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount you're supposed to collect. Soldiers even came and said, what should we do? And he said, don't extort money from anyone. Be satisfied with your wages. All these things, I think, tell us that these are specific things, like the way you do your job, the way you share or don't share, the way you treat your neighbor. These are the specific things that God wants us to be honest about. So I um, told the children in the children's message my top three, and I figured I'd start. I'm not going to ask you all with a microphone during the prayer time to say yours. Worry. So when I say worry, I mean, um, obviously I want to plan. Obviously I want to have things go well. Obviously, I love people and I don't want things to happen to them. But I mean worry that goes beyond what is helpful, which is happens pretty quick. Pretty quick. The second one is, um, I wrote them down so I would be honest. Resisting the need to rest. This past Wednesday night, I didn't feel good. I kept going back and forth in my mind. If I don't go to church on the Wednesday night dinner, I'm not doing a very good job as a pastor. I need to go to the church. And then um, angel, devil, I don't know what. <laughs> no, you need to rest. You're exhausted. You have a sore throat. You don't need to give it to anyone. No, but I need to go. No, you need to rest. So this is a microcosm of what goes on in my life all the time. I resist the need to rest. And the third one is giving priority to really good friends that I put at the end of the list of my time. So I'll get these things done. I have a list. I'll be a good pastor. I'll be a good Presbytery stated clerk called, um, hopefully Chuck doesn't get left out of the top priority, but then really good friends. Um, I'll see you next week. Okay, it's not this month, it's gonna be next month. Okay, maybe it's not gonna be 2019, it's gonna be 2020. These are the things I feel like I need to be honest with God and hey, there's nothing like being honest with someone else to help you be accountable. 
for some within the sound of my voice, I think um, a major thing to get ready for Christmas, something you might ask God to help you repent from, is blaming yourself for things that aren't your fault. Does that resonate with anyone? Or blaming yourself for something that keeps happening and you wish you could change it, but you can't. Telling God, honestly, I have blamed myself, I have been miserable, I have worried myself over something that I, is not my fault or that I cannot change. Seems like something that would let in the joy of Christmas. If God could help us work on that. So God is calling to repent. And I am suggesting that you give the Lord 100% reign over you, over uh, your life, that you are honest and that you let the Lord help you change your perspective and live differently so that there'll be no obstacles to the joy of Christmas. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen.